Kelly, why do you always add the part about and all girls? Her response, because everybody else always finishes their prayers by saying all men. <laughs> was describing how Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. When little Jason interrupted, my mommy looked back once while she was driving and turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> a Sunday school teacher said to her children, we have been learning how powerful kings and queens were in the Bible time, but is there a higher power? Can anyone tell me what it is? One child blurted out, aces. <laughs> aces be kings and queens. Because God Almighty Himself 
has worked things out. Amen. And because God does work it out, and because God is faithful, and because God is loving, and because God is divine, and because God takes care of us, we can trust that this God will provide for us. Amen. That this God will do what He promises. Because God works it out, I believe. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is addressing. This Hebrew writer that we don't know who it is, which is awesome, that it's a book on faith and we don't know who it is. <laughs> we just got to believe that, hey, amen. It just happened to work out. No. The Hebrew writer is saying in chapter 11, look at these men and women who have held faithfully to what God said He would do. This is an example, brothers and sisters, of men who regardless of circumstance held on to the promise of God. And through holding on to the promise of God, got to see how, ex how exactly God did indeed work everything out. These are examples in Hebrews 11 of men and women who have true faith. You know, there's two ways to say the past our faithfulness to the promises of God. And that is through circumstance, and that is through emotion. True faith. True faith focuses more on our godly decisions than the circumstances of our life. It is so easy to get caught up in the circumstances of life and trying to change the circumstances rather than responding faithfully to the God who is in control of the circumstances. You and I cannot control our circumstances. Sometimes we get ourselves in bad situations because of bad decisions. Sometimes we get ourselves in such an ugly, quagmire mess of, how did I get here? Sometimes it's through a series of ungodly decisions. Sometimes it's just the way that the divine God has orchestrated things to work out. Our response in situations needs to be to God, not our circumstances. Amen. It is so easy for you and I to get caught up in the circumstance rather than the God of the circumstance. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are an incredible example of that. They found themselves in front of this fire and an angry king. You do what I say, or I'm throwing it into you. I'm throwing you into the fire. Well, I'm not going to do what you say, and you may throw me into the fire, and God may rescue me, He may not rescue me. But I'm not going to bow down to you, King. They can't control that circumstance, but they can control their response to it. To be godly in that situation. Job is another great example of that. Satan tries to get Job to think that God is mad at him. Satan works in such a way that it's the fire, it's the wind. Job's friends come in, they're like, God's mad at you, what did you do? God's not mad at Job at all. But Satan's trying to get, God, get Job to think that God's mad at it. And that's how Satan works. Satan tries to get you and I to think God's against me, he's opposing me, he's mad at me. I'm not this because God isn't that. If God was this, then I would. God, look, God is either for you or against you. And He is for you so much more than He's against us. And it is so easy for us to get caught up in this negative mindset about God. When the Bible says God, who not only gave His only Son for you, how much more will He give you all things? God is so much on our behalf. On our behalf. God is so much for us. Look here at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, this verse in verse 35. Come on, Doug. Hebrews 11, verse 35, it says, Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Now this is an amazing thought. Most of us beg God to get out of our circumstances. Most of us, when we are in, a, in an incredibly difficult place, say, God, please deliver us. These people were set free, and they said, no, I want to stay in this incredibly difficult situation to gain a better resurrection. Meaning, I want to let this hard situation...
situation. Produce Christ in me in a way that He's not in me right now. Because that's what hard things do. They take us to the core, don't they? Don't they? Man, when things get really hard, when they get really difficult, oh, everything's stripped away, isn't it? Yeah. Everything gets taken away. What if my shoes match my outfit that day? It doesn't matter. Right? Uh, whether we only have wheat toast instead of white bread, that doesn't matter that day. I mean, when it gets hard, we get down to some really deep issues. Right? And here's these people who are beaten, flogged, and they're saying, okay, you can, you can go free. No, we want to stay here. We want to stay in this incredible trial to become more like God. That's an incredible challenge for you and I. My sinful nature is it's hard. Let me take control and figure it out. I'm going to take control of this. This is what needs to happen. This is how it needs to happen. This is what we're going to do. Rather than surrendering, walking with God, trusting God, embracing what God has to offer. God is the God of circumstance. And faithfulness is being faithful to the God who controls our circumstance. Scholars say that there's a great lead-in that, that Hebrews chapter 11 is actually a precursor or a, a follow-up to Hebrews chapter 10. In this last passage we're going to read about, they're saying that Hebrews 11 is, is solely there because of this passage right here. Hebrews chapter 10. Look here at verse 32. Come on, Don. Remember those earlier days, Hebrews 10, 32. After you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a very little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if He shrinks back, I will not be pleased with Him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. The Hebrew church had been around about 30 years when this was written. And they were older in their faith, and they were beginning to shrink back in their faith. They were beginning to straight, shrink back from the persecution. They were beginning to shrink back from the calling of Christ. They were going back to their humanistic ways. And they were beginning to lose their faith, and that's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. Jesus is greater than Moses. we got to have faith. All these things. And he said, you guys are shrinking back. So let me use chapter 11 to give you an example of people who have not shrunk back. <laughs> you guys are losing your faith as the time goes by. Let me show you those who stayed faithful when they were tempted to shrink back. Chapter 11 is, 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 is showing us what chapter 10, 32 through 39 is talking about. I've been a Christian 22 years. And more than ever, I am tempted to shrink back in a lot of different ways. I'm tempted to shrink back in my energy level. I'm 47 right now. And I feel 47 right now. Like some 40-year-olds, 47, like, I feel 40, right? Whatever. I feel maybe 48. I don't know you. I feel like Definitely not 49. Maybe 48. I feel tempted to shrink back in confronting my friends who are doing the wrong thing. Come on, Dodge. Christian or not. I haven't shrunk back from confronting Drew, though. I shrunk back from confronting a lot of people, but not Drew. And he's not shrunk back from confronting me. Amen. Uh, and Victor's fired up about it. I have shrunk back in sharing my faith. Just yesterday, I had a rough day. And I found myself 
in some restaurant at 12.30 and I was not supposed to be there at all. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for my alternator to get fixed in my car and spending $400. It's not what the day of the conference was supposed to go like, you know what I mean? And I found myself there and I'm Pan Express, that's what it was. And it's 12.30. And I'm, I have in me this, this conference. I have in me, people are driving here right now. We've been planning for months. And I, I have this moment of looking out and saying, how do I get this to them? I'm sitting in this restaurant. I doubt many of them are saved, if any of them. I'm right with God. I've got Jesus. I've got, I've got this in me. And how do I get it out? How, how do I let them know? And I look around at each person and I go, how do I get it to them? And I don't know about you, but it's one of the greatest struggles I feel. Is how do I get what I have to you? How do I get what I know into a conversation with you? How, how, do, I, how do I get it out? And it's a struggle that I constantly feel. Now I went through, and in my sin, I looked and could tell that nobody was open simply by the yeah. video. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not open. They're not open. Oh, they're too busy. They're not open. Yeah. And you know, I don't, I don't know why I sinfully decide whether someone's open to Jesus or not, but I do it, and it's wrong, and I hate it. And there, next to me was two girls who were probably 17 and a boy who was 17-ish, something like that. And they were laughing. They were close to the table. I'm like, I'm like, I, I gotta get ready for my lesson. No. Other than this, I gotta get ready. I need you, darling. Find out. So I didn't share my faith. Um, and they got in the car. And uh, I saw fish somewhere on the back of And then on the bumper I saw a cable at the radio station. I just almost cried. They have some kind of faith. They have some kind of faith. They're proclaiming with a symbol and with a bumper sticker. And I just felt so empty because I did not stand up and walk over and say, you have a conference, it would be great to have you guys come. Because I was so caught up in my busyness of life. And uh, we, we can't shrink back from who Jesus is and what he's called us to do. And, I, and I'm sorry, please forgive me. Uh, and I apologize to God. Um, it's great to come to the conference. It's great. It's awesome to be here. But this conference is not what we are about. Right. What you do at Panda Express, what you do at school, what we do in line, what we do with our neighbors. On, that's not how it goes out. And preferably this time will strengthen us. Yeah. Um, and help us to have the courage that we need. Um, the older we get, the more we, we tend to shrink back. And that day when we stand before Jesus, it's not going to be if we went to a conference in 2011. It's going to be, did you shrink back? Did we stand up for the Lord? Did we preach Jesus? Hebrews 11 is about people who in extreme hardship did not shrink back. Hebrews 11 is not about initial professions of faith. It's about lives of faith. You see, the end is the evidence of a true beginning. The end of your spiritual life is the evidence of whether you truly live a spiritual life. Yep. 
True believers start in faith, continue in faith, and die in faith. There's nobody mentioned in Hebrews 11 that died separate from God. Hebrews 11 is about those who live in faith. See, true faith is if you die faithful. Christianity isn't about becoming a Christian. Christianity is about dying a Christian. Many of us hurt for those who have left our church. Don't hurt for them. That's their decision to leave God and wander away. And not everybody who left our church has left the Lord. Please don't get caught up in what I'm saying. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people who have left because their heart drifted from the Lord. Uh, and, that's, and we're all on our spiritual journey, and I've, and I've gone through my journey, and I'm in my journey, and I've struggled. Um, our precious God, our beautiful God, our amazing God, is saying that with faith, great things can happen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, look at this. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Right. By his faith, this is what he did. Verse 8, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded the disgrace of the sake. He regarded the disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was a looking ahead to his reward. Faith allows amazing things to happen. Faith says, I will not look at my circumstances. I will look at the God who is in control of everything. And I will pray to my God who controls all things. And I will be faithful because he is faithful. A lot of us, we hate our physical ailments. We hate our physical struggles. A lot of us, we have problems financially. We have problems with our jobs. Our kids may or may not be Christians. Our parents, our families, our lives, our weight, our whatever it is. We have our struggles, and they are real, and they are tangible, and they are difficult. But a lot of us spend more time trying to change our circumstances to become like Jesus in the midst of our struggles. You are in where you're at because God is telling you something. God is communicating something to you. And if He's telling you this is my will for your life, then He's telling you this is my will for your life. Quit hating His will for your life. Start embracing what God is doing with you and become like Jesus in the process. I have very difficult challenges that I can espouse on for great many minutes. That are very difficult, difficult, difficult for me. It's not about changing our circumstances, you guys. It's about coming, becoming like Jesus. It's about letting Christ shine through you. It's about letting the world see not how everything's working out awesome for you, but how in the midst of your pain, there is a joy. There is a, a surrenderedness that draws people to you. We all want to be around winners, amen? Yeah. But winners isn't always the person who wins first place. Right. Right. Second point I have for you. Come on down. And this is where Hebrews leads us out to the supreme example of Jesus. Hebrews 10, 32 through 39 is about not shrinking back. And here's these great examples. Point number two, faith to see the end. Faith to see the end. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, whenever you see therefore, you need to see what it's there for. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, we've just done that. That's what Hebrews 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Right. What great cloud of witnesses? People who didn't shrink back. Who stay faithful. Therefore, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
It leads to Jesus, the true victor, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and scorned its shame. That word scorned its shame, what that means is, is that when Jesus saw, you mean that if I go through this, all mankind have the chance to be saved? Like if I go through this, all everybody that will ever live has a chance to be shamed, to be saved. All I have to do is go through this. He mocked the pain that he had to go through. He made fun of that pain because of the joy set before him. Because on the other side of this incredible pain, on the other side of this incredible hardship, is a chance for all mankind to be saved. And he saw the end of the struggle, not the struggle itself. We get so caught up in the struggle, we don't see what's on the other side. The other side is who we want to be. And so many of us in the middle of it, we quit. I can't. It's too hard. I don't want to do it. And we shrink back in the middle of the struggle. Christianity is up and down. But what matters is when you see Jesus, when you see Jesus, when you stand before Him on that glorious day, it will all be worth it. It will all be worth it on that day. I don't know about you, but when I see Jesus, there's two things I, one thing I want to feel and one thing I don't want to feel. I want to feel joy. And I don't want to feel guilt. I don't want to feel guilt. I don't want to get there and see how incredibly awesome it is and say, I wish I would have invited more people. I wish that I would have done more. You know, it's like the conference. There's people who chose not to come to the conference, and that's their choice. But if they could see what they see, if they could see, if they could be here, I wonder if they would have said, I wish I would have done whatever it took to be there. Right. That's so much our nature to go, no, I don't want to go to that. And we've all done that, right? I don't want to go in at the last minute went and be like, dude, I'm so glad I came. <laughs> I don't want to be like that in heaven. I don't want to get there and be like, I wish I, I, wish I would have asked so much more people. Yeah. Luke 16 tells us about that, right? right. The rich man, yeah. right. he finally gets to hell and he's like, I had no idea. Please, please go back and tell my family. Please go tell them how horrible this is. How many people in hell are begging for you and I to reach out to lost souls? How many family members have died and we're in contact with their family members and they're saying, please send them to go evangelize, go share, go tell about this. There's a scene that I want to show from the movie from Schindler's List. It's at the very end when he says, I wish I would have done more. Schindler's piece of earth I want. I want that cloth that's stripped to the workers. This Hebrew from the Talmud, it says, whoever saves one life saves the world in time.
not lose myself in that moment. You have to lose yourself in the moment in order to own it. I was convicted to see how Luke 9.23 goes hand in hand. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Right. If we don't lose our lives, we will not save them. Right. If we don't give up our lives, we will not be saved. Too many of us, including myself, have taken our life back. And we live in a spiritual holocaust. Not for the Jewish people, but for everybody alive. We are living in a spiritual holocaust. One of my favorite movies is Eight Miles. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite movies is Braveheart. Yeah. And it's the first time that the nation is united and they're fighting the king and they come together in this ragtag, nasty army and they're facing this amazing. Let's have the faith to see the end now before we get there. I love you guys. Let's have a great time.